You know, I didn't go to space, but I can pretend like I'm in space. How's this? That's about all I got. That's about all I got. It was unfortunate, but I tried. I tried. Now, I, we're going to learn a little bit about what it takes to live, have fun, and do work in space. I have in my pocket, and I always carry one because I am a space correspondent. This is a space pen. Has anybody ever heard of these? Raise your hand if you've heard of a space pen. Do you know how it works? I mean, because the trick is when you're in space and you go to write, you don't have the advantage of having gravity to help the ink flow. So they actually spent quite a bit of money, spent a lot of time and technology to create a pen that has a little bit of gas in there that sends the ink down and allows you to write in space. That's how the US solved the problem. Do you know how the Russians solved that same problem? Number two pencil, yes. So <laughs> there's more than one way to skin a cat in space, all right? So we're going to learn about a lot of things like that. For example, these suits, you see these big fat suits, Michelin man kind of things? It's kind of hard to do work in space. As a matter of fact, when you talk to spacewalkers who spend upwards of six, sometimes even longer hours in these suits, eight hours, they come back and their hands are bloody literally, because they have to keep squeezing. It's, it's constant pressure on those gloves, and they're constantly, as they do their work, having to fight against the suit. We're going to uh, see in just a little bit a novel new idea for a spacesuit, which would change the whole equation in a very, very big way. Now, there were some pictures up here of some people in space washing their hair and fooling around in space. We're going to talk to them. Uh, and get a little sense from them as to how they go about life in space. Uh, it's obviously very different when you take gravity out of the equation. We're also um, going to hear from somebody directly from space, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, who's up on the International Space Station. She launched in April. Uh, how many people know here, how many people are in space at the moment? Do you know? There are six people on the International Space Station, six people up there. And, and that's a very exciting thing. You know, the space station is about the size of a football field now. It's about a million pounds. Of course, it doesn't weigh anything in space. It's a million pounds of mass. And with the six people on there, they can do an awful lot of scientific experiments. And there's, we're just beginning that era for the space station. The construction phase is now winding down. The shuttle is winding down. And now we're moving to a very exciting era for the space station where who knows what we'll discover up there uh, that we can only find because we take gravity out of the equation and learn a little something about how protein crystals grow, how drugs can be made, uh, how, how uh, bacterium uh, operate and, and become more virulent. There's a lot of interesting science that we're just on the cusp of at the International Space Station. Now, uh, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, she is a very interesting person, uh, and she... Um, has some very interesting things to say about what it's like to live in space. And we, are, are, we didn't just get anybody to ask the questions. There were over 100 students who submitted questions, suggested questions to send up to her for her to answer. There are the six finalists are sitting in the, sitting in the front row. I want them to stand up, please. Stand up. They are Mohammed Sabur, Emily Dean, Shazina Khan, Johnny McNicholas, Kezi Chang, and Natalie Pujols. Give them a round of applause. They asked some really good questions. And so they're, they're going to be like your little proxy today. Uh, and uh, as the, uh, on your behalf, they have asked questions of her. You guys can sit down for now. And uh, they haven't even heard the answers yet. We didn't even do it in rehearsal. So this is their, they're on the edge of their seats. So the longer I talk, the more nervous they're going to get. No, so I, I, better, I better move along here. Let's tell, tell you a little bit about Tracy's trip to space. She launched in April on a Soyuz rocket. And we have a little video to show you how she got to where she is. Lift off. 
liftoff at Alexander Sportsov, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, and Mikhail Kornienko beginning their journey to the International Space Station. The Soyuz is heading toward a link up with the International Space Station. The station commander being instructed by the Russian flight control team now to open up the equalization valve. <laughs> and hatch is now open. <laughs> Mom, you all look wonderful, and you look like you had a good flight, and happy Easter. Uh, hello, Tracy, it's your husband. You're grinning from here to here. It looks like you're happy to be in your home. Enjoy your time up there, and I'll be talking to you soon. I love you. Love you, too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without... Much further ado, let's go almost live to space just a few days ago and listen to Tracy Caldwell Dyson as she answers your questions. Here she is. Hello to all of you at the World Science Festival in New York City. I'm Tracy Caldwell Dyson welcoming you to the International Space Station. Right now we're orbiting 220 miles above the Earth, traveling at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. I'm originally from California, and I love music. In fact, I'm the lead singer for an all-astronaut band called Max Q, back home on Earth. I became an astronaut in 1998, the same year as my fellow astronaut, Leland Melvin, who's with you today. Hi, Leland. I hope you're doing well. Life in space is very different than life on Earth, and it's a lot of fun being weightlessness, as you can tell. I'm really excited to be able to answer a few of your questions from the students who are there in the audience today. So let's get to those questions now. First, from Mohaben Sabor, a 12th grader at Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics. And he asks, what is your role on ISS and what is a typical day for you at work? Well, Mohammed, I'm a flight engineer, and my job is to help maintain this amazing space station that we have. I perform experiments for the scientists on the ground, and I help to operate robotic arms and do spacewalks in order to help build and also repair the space station if needed. Here's a question from Emily Dean, a sixth grader at the Brooklyn Prospect Charter School. And Emily asks, when you sleep, do you just float or do you strap yourself to a bed? And if you have a blanket, how does it stay on? Well, Emily, I do float, but I float inside of a sleeping bag. And my sleeping bag is strapped, though lightly, to the wall of my crew quarter. And my crew quarter is about the size of a big, big box that you could probably fit a refrigerator in. And I don't use a blanket because my sleeping bag keeps me pretty warm. Okay, this one's from Shazina Khan, an 11th grader at Queens High School for the Sciences at New York College. And she asks, human spaceflight is very expensive and time consuming. Wouldn't it be better to fund and send more robotic spacecraft to explore outer space? What's your justification for human missions? Well, Shazina, that's a really hard question, but a very good one. I'll tell you that life itself is very time consuming and expensive and exploration is a, an important part about human history, our human history. And so if you believe that, then consider that there's no replacement for human senses uh, in exploration. Senses like your sight, your hearing, your taste, your touch, your sense of smell, and most important probably is your sense of intuition. Now, it's, um, I believe that if you uh, consider that, like learning music, for instance, would it be better to learn music from, uh, from say, a radio or actually going to a concert itself? And so I believe that you need both, robotic missions and human missions. And in order to improve human life here on Earth, then there's no other way to do that but through human missions where we bring back the technology that's developed to help execute those missions. I really appreciate your question because it really does explain why we're here. Next, we have Johnny McNicholas, a first grader at Goose Hill Primary School in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. 
I like this one. Johnny asks, do you feel like a superhero in space? And what kind of music do you listen to on the space station? Well, Johnny, I do feel like a superhero. I get to zoom around in this huge space station. Although I don't have a cape, but Superman, I mean, Spider-Man doesn't either, and neither does Wonder Woman. But you do kind of feel like you're larger than life as you look out the window and see the Earth below. And I do listen to music here on Space Station. Most of it is Christian rock. Next, we have Kezi Chang, an 11th grader at the Bronx School of Science. And Kezi asks, does being in space give you a completely new outlook on the universe and how significant or insignificant we are? I would say that definitely the view of Earth, it is a completely new look at the universe, especially when you see the stars and the blackest black you've ever seen in the background. And are we significant? Well, when you look out at that black sky, that we call the universe, then, and you see this blue planet below you, then you think there must be some significance. But are we insignificant? Well, when you look into the blackness of space and you think that goes on for infinity, you wonder just how significant you could be. It's a really good question. And I think that you could argue both. And last but not least, we have Natalia Pujos, a fourth grader at PS58, the Carroll School in Brooklyn. Natalia asks, what do astronauts take to eat? Do you have to be careful what you eat in space? Do you eat fresh fruit or is it all packaged food? Well, Natalia, astronauts take um, very little with them to eat because it's all packed for them and brought up in, in other vehicles such as the shuttle or a Progress. We uh, do have foods that are brought up, foods like chocolate covered coffee beans, strawberries, and one of my favorites, coffee with cream and sugar. You do have to be really careful with wh how you eat and what you eat because things float just like you do and they float everywhere as you can see. So they do bring us fresh fruit in, um, on the shuttle and on progresses because uh, as you know it could spoil and so we can't keep it here for long. And uh, a lot of it, most of it, is packaged food. Well, anyway, thanks for all your excellent questions. It's been fun sharing this experience with you, and I hope you're having a great time at the World Science Festival. Be well, and add Austria. All right. Pretty cool stuff. So I imagine you have a few more qu great questions, guys. Give them a round of applause. Those are really good questions. But I, I'm willing to guess there are a few more questions that you all have. And of course, you, does everybody know what the number one question that is asked of astronauts is? How do you go to the bathroom, right? So, and in a word, it sucks. But the, we'll explain in just a moment. And, and we're going to have some people who have been there to do that. So let's, uh, let's take a look at who's coming up on stage here and give you a little sense of who you're about to meet. OK, the astronauts are kind of young, aren't they, these days? No. <laughs> this is Sandy Magnus at a younger age. And she, uh, she grew up in Belleville, Illinois. And she um, really enjoyed playing soccer, I believe. Sandy, is that you right up there? Is that, that the right place? Is that you? OK, that's Sandy there playing soccer. She still plays soccer? You still play soccer? I don't know if you did it on the space station, though. And uh, ultimately, she studied hard and became an engineer. Uh, and she got to do cool things like this to get ready to go to space, which is, um, uh, you know, actually, the, it's just as much fun to train for a space mission, I think, as it is to go to space. And these guys will tell you a little bit about that. And, uh, and then there's the, the classic astronaut portrait. That's Sandy. She's coming up here in a second. Joining her is the only astronaut in the astronaut corps who played professional football, albeit for about 30 seconds, I think, right? It was, well, there, there, this, is, this is young Leland. There he is when he played for the Detroit Lions before he pulled his hamstring. And uh, that actually, that, I, I, we've talked to Leland about this before. That injury was probably a good thing for him because it sent him on a completely different direction. And... Um, <laughs> There it is. That's where he's headed. <laughs> sort of uh, mad science kind of guy. And uh, Leland is, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, he's, he's a good guy. Everybody loves Leland. And uh, he's been to space a couple of times and um, has a great, interesting, eclectic career. But it's a great lesson for all you kids out there. Listen, sports are wonderful. Sandy played soccer. Leland played football at a very high level. 
don't forget about the books. You got to keep studying. It's just, if nothing else, it's a good fallback when the hamstring goes or when you just can't do the sports anymore. So in any case, they're going to come up here and, and do a bunch of things. They have a whole presentation about life in space. And then after that, we're going to be able to take some of your questions. So if you have any questions, keep them in mind. Uh, at the, I'll come out into the audience with a microphone, and we'll get your questions out, out, uh, addressed to them. So without further ado, let me introduce Sandy Magnus and Leland Melvin. Good job. Hello, everyone. Hello, How are you guys doing? Him. All right. How many of you out here play sports? Football, basketball, soccer, soccer. tennis. Good. What else? Running, swimming, running. baseball. Okay. Well, sports was very important in my life, as Miles just mentioned. But you know, the training for sports is very similar to the training that we do for being an astronaut. And I want to tell you a little bit about how, my, how I became an astronaut. I, I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, a small town. And uh, my, uh, my dad taught me all about sports. But he made sure, because they were both school teachers, they made sure that I had a, a strong foundation in academics. So if you want to be a ball player, you can always go for that, a rapper, musician, whatever. Go for it. But make sure you have that education to fall back on, as Miles said. Because if you pull your hamstring, you still have an opportunity to be an astronaut. I flew on two space shuttle missions. <laughs> I flew on two space shuttle missions, STS-122 and STS-129. And I did what we call a, a short duration space flight. And Sandy's going to talk a little bit about her doing a long duration space flight. I flew, I, well, I, I was a, a soccer player as well. But so Leland asked how many of you guys play sports. So how many of you guys like science? Everybody should be raising their hands. Um, that's why I got into being an astronaut, because I like the whole idea of, of uh, learning about how the world works and then exploring it. It's really a lot of fun. And since I've joined NASA, I've had the opportunity to fly twice as well. My first mission was a short mission, just like uh, Leland's, where you take the shuttle to the station, deliver some things, attach it, come home. But on my second mission, which I just returned from last uh, March, I was able to live on the space station for four and a half months. Uh, similar to what you see Tracy doing now. And that's really a great adventure. It's such a difference between a short mission and a long mission because when you're on a short mission, you're very much in a sprint mode. You're, you're hurrying, you're hurrying, you've got things to do, you've got a short amount of time to get it done in, you really can't afford to step back and think about what's going on. But living there for four and a half months, I had Sunday, you know, half a Saturday and Sundays off, and I developed a lifestyle there. I mean, that was my <laughs> life, that was my home. And it was really, really special to get to experience that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that today. But of course, before we, uh, we uh, get to live on the space station, we have to actually get there, and Leland, Explain a little bit about that. Thanks, Andy. So we trained for about a year and a half, for about a year for a space shuttle flight. And I, my first flight, we trained. Uh, I did robotics. And I'll show you some of the, some of the things we've done later. But you first have got to get in the suit and get ready to get on the vehicle. So can you roll the video, please? So we, we're about three and a half hours before we launch. We're in our pumpkin suits. They put us in. We walk out. We get in the vehicle. This is the gantry to get us into the shuttle until we get in, kind of sit there. And we wait for that proverbial three, two, one blast off. Actually, lift off, because blast off doesn't sound too cool when you're on a rocket with a lot of propellant. <laughs> but we have a lift off, and it was one of the most amazing things I've ever felt. You know, you're shaking, you're rattling, you're rolling. And people asked me if I was afraid, and I said no, because I was the one screaming, woohoo! <laughs> so we do a rotation, we're going up. We are uh, about two and a half minutes into the flight the solid rocket boosters jettison. And so those fall back in the ocean. And uh, we have a tugboat that actually picks them up and we, we reuse them. And then about eight and a half minutes later, you are now in space. And the external tank is jettisoned. So that's falling back to the Earth, burning up. Some pieces fall in the ocean. And then you're trying to turn this vehicle from your spaceship into your home. So that's me coming out of my, my uh, pumpkin suit. There's Bobby playing with his water bag. And there's no attitude in space, no up or down. So there's Comrade right side up, and I'm kind of upside down. Scorch is working in the front. So that's kind of uh, the, the first part of getting to space. Now we're going to talk about what we actually do working in space. You know, you train all this time. We did robotics, spacewalks, uh, payloads and science, all these different types of things. So we want to show you some of the other things that we do in space. Okay, roll the video. So, Anyone here play video games? 
Okay, right. Everyone does. But um, I never really played a lot of video games, but all of our training to do the robotics is like a big video game. When I went to space, we didn't have this window that could look out, so we had to do everything with the, the monitors there that you see. So that's the robotics workstation on the station. We have a shuttle arm, and we have a station arm. So what we do is we grab the payloads out of the payload bay of the shuttle, present them to the station arm. That's what's going on here. This is one of our pallets that we took up on SCS-122. About 30,000 pounds of cargo that we put up on the space station. So that goes up, and then we grapple it with the station arm, and then put it in place on the space station. So that's a way that we actually can service the space station when the space shuttle goes away. We'll have all of that hardware up there, like control moment gyros, pumps, spare parts for the, uh, for the robotic arm. Those things are there pre-positioned, ready to uh, be used. So that's uh, working in space. Next slide. So after you work in space, you do all these things, you've got to come home. So this is a fly around, kind of sped up a little bit, but a fly around of the space station as the shuttle goes around it. So we want to take pictures of it, make video of it to make sure that there's no damage on the station. So we actually send these pictures back down to the ground, and they can kind of assess the station. Now the station is about as long as the football field. And you have all of these different modules put together with, from uh, people from all over the world. It's a great international program. And when I was up there, we had so many people working hard together. I had to learn some Russian. Sandy spent a lot of time in Russia working, Japan, Germany, all over the world to get this International Space Station done. So that's another part of working in space coming home. Next slide. And from this vantage point, you see so many beautiful colors. When you look out the window, you sometimes see the, the Earth limb is where the sun is rising. We don't have that picture here, but the Caribbean, the colors of the water are so beautiful. Aqua, teal, blue, all these colors. You almost need new definitions to define what the colors are because they're just so strikingly rich. And it's just one of the most beautiful things when you see out the window the planet going by you. You're going by every 90 minutes around the planet. And so you see so many you know, snow-capped mountains, the oceans, the, uh, I was looking down on my friend's house with a zoom lens to see what he was doing. <laughs> but you can see so many really cool things. And uh, it's just an amazing, amazing sight. Yeah, it's funny. People have asked me uh, when I've given different talks if I, ever have gotten, if I ever got bored while I was on the space station. And it's like, no, you, you can't get bored because you can just simply, when you have a free moment, go look out the window and see what part of the Earth is wandering by. Because even if you're over the ocean, and we do have so much ocean, and we really are a water planet, the cloud formations all have different characteristics and all moods and things like this. So it's, uh, it's always very interesting to look out the window, so you're never bored. We stay busy, as Leland mentioned. We do the robotics and spacewalks to support the construction and maintenance of the station. And we have a lot of Earth photography we do for the Earth scientists. But there's a lot of other science that we do in space as well. And it really is an international effort. One day I was talking to scientists from the US, Germany, Japan, and Russia. And it was really kind of neat. Uh, in the, we're in the microgravity environment. If you can throw the tape, there's a really uh, nice visual of why we do studies in space. This is water. It's a reptile. It, <laughs> I am a reptile. This is true. On the ground, of course, gravity drives the behavior of liquids, especially, you know, you pour it into a glass. It stays in the glass. It takes the shape of the glass because that's gravity, gravity working on the water. In space, for liquids, something called surface tension takes over, and that drives the behavior. And so here you see a very strong example of what surface tension forces do when they're interacting with your hand or with other surfaces. It kind of gives water a sticky, or liquids a sticky feel, if you will. And so... We're there in space doing these experiments on you know, various phenomena just to understand what changes. Because as we learn how materials grow differently, how liquids behave differently, how our bodies change in space, we can take all of that knowledge and not only apply it to make technology we need to continue exploration, but we can take that technology uh, and bring it back into everyday lives. You know, your UV coating on your sunglasses. Uh, some of you guys are into golf or bicycling. You've got really strong, lightweight metals. All these things come out of the space program. So this is why we're on the space station. So we do a lot of work up there. But, and of course, when we're there for four and a half months, we have to figure out how to live in space, too, which is, which is sort of fun and challenging. And Leland can talk to you a little bit about that. OK, so Tracy talked about her sleeping her crew quarters on the space station. Now, when you're a short-duration space flight member, you don't have the luxury of having your own crew quarters. So you have to figure out where you're going to put your sleeping bag, how you're going to orient it, and how you're going to sleep. So we've got a little video showing me sleeping on the space station. 
And actually, this is a good, a good sample of the background noise. There's kind of a general high level of white noise on the station. Yeah, I wore earplugs, actually, while I was sleeping. Yeah, me too. Video. Inside my crew quarters. Oh, inside your crew quarters. How you doing? Oh, it's time to wake up. Oh, this is our sleeping bag right here, sleeping in node one, and uh, had a good night's sleep, but now it's time to get to work. So, so if you're sleeping in space and you're used to having a pillow on the ground, how do you put a pillow on your head in space? And that was a concern I had. How am I going you know, to have this pillow around my head? And I said, oh, yeah, Velcro. You just Velcro the pillow to your head, and it's all in place, ready to go. So you know, for the short duration flights, you know, we put these sleeping bags anywhere. You kind of bungee them anywhere you want. So when you undock from the space station, you have, we had six people actually six people on my second flight, but seven people on my first flight that were actually having to maneuver around this small area. So you had you know, sleeping bags going this way, some people crossing, and I slept actually in the airlock with Mike Foreman. And Mike, he's a pretty big guy, you know, we're sitting there trying to uh, you know, orient our sleeping bags. So he actually had his, his feet of his sleeping bag oriented right where my head was. So, Every time I woke up in the middle of the night, I'm like pushing on his feet, you know, trying to get to the bathroom and so forth. But you want to try to make sure you have your sleeping bags oriented the right way. So that's sleeping in space. How do you do personal hygiene in space? You know, one of the things that you have to do is make sure you stay clean. And so, next slide. This is how we uh, brush our teeth in space, just like you would on the ground, you know, toothpaste, toothbrush. You see, here's my little personal hygiene kit. I've got some, uh, some deodorant. We have my little clippers there on the bottom. You know, I've got some lotion. All these different things you have, you know, on the ground. The key here is that when you go to spit your, you know, your toothpaste and your saliva out, you can't just go spit it out in the sink. There's no sink. So what we have to do is get a washcloth. This is what we did. They have a different way Short of processing timers. their stuff. <laughs> we get a washcloth and we just, you know, very slowly spit into the washcloth, close it up, and get it to wet the washcloth. And then we put that in a little grommet, let it sit there for maybe a few hours, let it dry out, and we put that in our dry trash. Now, how do you take okay, care of so your? OK, so the short timers, they need pillows. <laughs> <laughs> they can't swallow their toothpaste like we do in the long duration. That's nasty. No, it's fine. That's, you, that's you, just dilute, you just dilute it with a little bit of water, and then it's just like a fresh minty flavor, and it's OK. <laughs> Minty flavor? You, you know, we have, we have a consumable issue when you're up there. It's like being on a camping trip, right? You only have so many wash rags, you only have so many towels, you only have so many clothes, and so you get into these modes of how to conserve things as much as possible, and by swallowing your toothpaste, you're saving a lot of wash rags over time, and it just gets really messy over months and months yeah. of doing that, so it's not so good. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> that's all I know. So. so the next thing of living in space is, you know, that million-dollar question. How do you use the bathroom in space? And Miles said it sucks. And it's a very delicate thing to do. You don't want to rush when you're using the bathroom. On my first flight, um, you know, you kind of sit down. I'll show you. We have a different toilet than we do from the station. Okay, Our, our toilet looks more like a, a real toilet. They've got something that looks like something from the Stone Ages. But when you train to use the toilet on the ground, they actually have a video camera in the bottom of the toilet. So, because, you know, you've got to be lined up just right. Or you're going to be cleaning lots of things that you don't want to be cleaning. So, so, you know, if you can hit the crosshairs, you have a little monitor sitting right in front of you. You want to make sure you hit the crosshairs. So, I mean, but this is all living in space. It's very important. You've got to, you've got to be perfect at it, you know? So you don't want things, you know, floating around. So, so the toilet. On the shuttle side, it's conventional. We have things that hold our legs down. We have stirrups and so forth. But on the other hand, Sandy's toilet. Next slide. We had a, this is a Russian uh, design. It's very simple, but it's actually easy to use. You do worry the first time you use the restroom, how well is it going to work? Because that's not really, as a rookie, how you want to start your mission. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to start But it works really way. simply. It's a really simple concept. I mean, when the engineers had to figure out how to make a toilet, so the whole idea was make things go away from you. So they came up with airflow as a good substitute for gravity. And so you turn on a switch. It starts some airflow through the funnel. 
and through the hose and you can urinate right into the funnel and uh, the urine gets captured into some tanks. And uh, on board now we have the ability to recycle urine and recycle condensate or bad water and make it potable. So we're closing our life support system so that it's all self-contained, which is what we need to do to continue our exploration uh, away from the earth. And so uh, it works pretty well. We have a toilet seat that we sit on and, you know, on the shuttle. Leland mentioned there's some, some uh, straps that can hold you down. This is a small enough compartment that I could put one hand on the ceiling and hold mm -hmm. myself onto the, uh, onto the toilet. And it, it works fine. It's simple, which is good. If the toilet breaks down, it stops all work on the space station because everybody on the ground is now focused on getting the toilet running again. So you need a <laughs> toilet that's highly reliable. But... Um, of course, also living in space, you know, we have to figure out how to eat. For space station, we're on a 16-day standard rotating menu, and uh, so that means every 16 days we see the same food. And it's not bad. We don't have a refrigerator. The food's either uh, dehydrated, we add water, or it's sort of like meals ready to eat where you've got cans and, and pouches that you warm up. There's food from Russia. There's food from the U.S. It's quite varied. And then with Jap Japan has shown up with some food, and I think Europe is working on some. So we do have some variety, even though every 16 days it's the same thing. If you show the, uh, the food video, we were going to be up there over a lot of holidays, and I like to cook, so I actually did some cooking in space. This is the galley area. We have two of these now on Space Station. This is back in the Russian segment. It was very comfortable to go to the ceiling and then put your drink bag there at the galley. I'm actually extracting water into a drink bag. Um, like I said, I like to cook, so I planned on doing some cooking, which in space means you're mixing things together in different new exciting ways. Uh, we were up there for <laughs> Christmas and Russian Christmas and New Year's. We had a lot of holidays, and so I had some time. And I basically discovered that with duct, uh, duct tape and Ziploc bags, you can pretty much do anything. What is that? Well, let's see, I think that might be my tuna surprise, and I had an Italian night, and it was actually turned out pretty good. It was not so appetizing, but it was new flavors, so we enjoyed it. <laughs> so, you have to be careful when you eat in space. Of course, uh, Leland mentioned hygiene. If you'll show the next video, as a female, one of the more challenging things that I had to figure out how to do, which surprised me, was how to wash my hair. Because I can't just get under a shower and let, you know, water falling on your head is a beautiful thing. Everyone, don't take that for granted. Um, I didn't have that I, problem. Yeah. <laughs> now, he's got the perfect space haircut. Mine's, mine and Tracy's is not so good. But I had to figure out how to get the water on my hair out of the drink bag without splashing it all over and get the shampoo on and then vigorously rub the shampoo and again, without splashing bubbles all over the place. And of course, we're trying to minimize towels, so I can't use three towels every time I'm trying to wash my hair. And that took about a month to figure out. Mm. And, fi and finally, uh, we do have chores in space. If you show the next video, you can show we have to vacuum every week. We have to dust. It, it's a little bit more fun up there to do chores than here. You can float around holding the I'm a soccer player, so I was holding the vacuum cleaner on my foot. And um, so, you know, we do have time to have fun in space. And I think, Leland, you can talk some more about that. Yeah, so fun in space, you know, we have different things that we do. We call them stupid astronaut tricks. And, uh, you know, being a former football player, you know, for like, you know, what Miles said, you know, 30 seconds in the NFL, maybe 15 seconds in the NFL, I had a relationship with the uh, NFL Hall of Fame. And so we were actually able to take up the NFL Super Bowl coin on our SCS-122 mission in November. And I was able to flip that in space, and that came back down, and they used it in the coin toss with Emmett Smith. So I'm going to show you a little video clip of how you flip a coin in space. We're on the International Space Station with Commander Williams and Commander Hobart. Commander Williams is representing the AFC, Army, and Commander Hobart is representing the Navy, the NFC. We're going to do a coin toss here. Here are both sides of the coin. This is heads. This is Tails. <laughs> the coin's gone. How are we going to decide? All right, let's go. So, so before we actually floated up to get the coin, we had to do you know, rocks, papers, and scissors to decide who, what commander. You know, those you know, military guys are so competitive. <laughs> oh, that was the, uh, that was the hit. Football. You gotta watch out for tackling in space. Now, this doesn't hurt at all. It, it feels just wonderful. Um, one more slow motion move. Woo! 
Now, actually, real quick, if you talk about physics and space, this is a perfect example of Newton's laws in action, because they're going to be flying into that next module until they hit a wall or somebody stops them, because it's energy in the system that's going to keep in motion. So, so you could apply physics to football in space very easily. So what we had to do was have someone in the Columbus module, the other module, actually catch us as we went down, because the last thing I wanted was another cut on my head from that first coin toss thing. So. Next, uh, let me see. So we have some more stupid astronauts. Yes, treats? we have some more stupid astronauts. Treats. We'll run the next slide on some more stupid astronauts. So treats, when, when I was younger, I could. Oh, these are yours. First. Oh, this is mine. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Playing with your food in space very important. When you take water out of your drink bag, it assumes a sphere, and so you know when the water starts floating away, you can actually put the straw in it and move it around, so you can guide it around the station. And this is three M and M's. You know we're. Again, stupid astronaut tricks, playing with your food. So here's the final assault on the water bubble. Now, don't do this at home, OK? It's a requirement to play with your food. You know, I almost choked. Go ahead, Sandy. I'm a frustrated gymnast. I never learned to do a cartwheel here on the planet. And so while I was up there, I did a lot of just fun stuff. You can act out your favorite superhero roles. You can do all kinds of fun things in your off time when you're on orbit. So we also have to exercise in space, right? That's true. Um, you know, we have a lot of fun on the weekends, but uh, an exercise is something we like to do for fun, stress relief, and we do two hours of exercise a day in order to keep our bones and our muscles strong enough to come back uh, when we're returning. And if you can go ahead and roll the video, we have several examples of, of exercise. This is the very early resistive exercise device. It's simulating weightlifting. We're working against some, some bungees to do squats and some of these big muscle group type of exercises. This is a device that Mike and I put together. This is also a resistive exercise device. And this really makes you feel like you're lifting weights. And I had that nice tired muscle feeling every day after working out on the advanced resistive exercise device. I tended to stretch every day too, because your natural body position is kind of like this. And people have been complaining of calves and hamstrings tight when they get back. We do an hour of cardiovascular exercise. You can run on the treadmill, bungee yourself down. That gives you a good, nice pounding, dynamic loading on your legs and, and hips and bones. And, and then on the bicycle ergometer, you can go and do sprint recovery kinds of things and get a really good cardiovascular workout. And if you do this pretty religiously for two hours a day, you, and with these various types of exercises, you can come back in pretty good shape. I was able to come back, stand up, walk off the orbiter. I didn't lose any bone or muscle. We're slowly learning you know, that the, with the right exercise protocols and things like this, we can mitigate some of the bone and muscle mass we've lost that we've seen in the past. We do know if you lose bone mass in space, uh, bone density in space, you can regrow that bone, but it grows back in a slightly different fashion. The structure's differently. And I mentioned earlier how we're human guinea pigs and we're doing science to understand how the, the human body changes in space, and we're looking at this structure change and, and again, trying to see if there's some applications to osteoporosis and, and really understanding what that means. So it's really very exciting. Everything we do is sort of inter interconnected in space. So and some, I'll turn so it back some over. final thoughts. Can you roll the next slide? Talk about this International Space Station that we have. It's one of the most uh, incredible vehicles for bringing people together. And on my first flight, SCS-122, on the day that we docked to the space station, the first female commander, Dr. Peggy Whitson, invited us over to dinner in the service module. So what you see here is a service module. And she, she said, OK, you guys bring the vegetables, and we'll have the meat. So we brought over some rehydrated vegetables. We floated over. We all just kind of assembled around the table. There was some music playing. Sade was playing. Smooth operator. You know, we were all kind of, you know, kind of grooving in there, eating. And you thought about this, the diversity of this crew. It was uh, African American, Asian American, uh, French, German, Russian, just the whole gamut of, of people. And the most incredible thing was we're all here breaking bread around this table going 17,500 miles per hour every 90 minutes circling the globe. And so we were thinking, at, as you look out the window down below, who's eating and breaking bread together? What different races, cultures, creeds are working together for civilization, for the betterment of humankind? And I think if more people can come to the space station and work together in this international crew, there'll be no more wars. There'll be no more racism. There'll be no more issues. So all of you get ready for space so that we can bring this bring this collective together, and it's just so important that we do this. And so that's, that was a thought that I had, you know, my first flight. And the second flight was very international. 
Sandy's been on some very international flights, and people have worked together just like that. Yeah, really, the space station, when you think about it, is a testimony to what human beings can do, and we put our minds to it. You know, we had to work across for decades. We had to work about different languages, different cultures, different ways of approaching engineering problems, different ways of handling problems, different measurement systems, um, all these things to build the space station. And we did it. We, we slowly put it up piece by piece. It went together perfectly the first time on orbit when we put these pieces from all over the world together. Uh, working out the planning of the missions in international forums. We ran into problems, you know, we ran into situations where we had disagreements. We were able to work through it all. And I had a moment where I was on Space Station one day after I'd talked to every single control center about something or other. It's like, wow. I mean, look at this. We did this. It took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of dedication, a lot of effort, a lot of determination, but we did it. And it's really a, a, a spectacular thing. And that's intangible benefit I think we're going to get from the Space Station program that we'll see in the next de few decades is it's a model for how we can all work together. It's just spectacular. It is. And one of the things that we haven't shown you yet is how to do spacewalking. And I, we have these two suits here. Dave Manuma is going to come up in a minute and talk about some future next generation suits. But I'm going to roll the clip showing how robotics and the spacewalks work together. So this is Bobby Satcher getting into his suit in the airlock. So Nicole, Cam Nicole Stott is helping him. There's Mike Foreman. He's one of my crewmates, and they're coming out of the airlock to do a servicing of an antenna. We're going to take an antenna out of the payload bay and attach it to the station. So I was working the robotic arm, flying Bobby around. Bobby was actually uh, you know, <coughs> flying in to get the antenna. There he is going into the, getting ready to go into the payload bay. There's Mike with a Go Navy beat army, so you know what flavor he is. He's a <laughs> Navy guy. Here's the antenna here in the payload bay, and we actually took that up and installed it on the, uh, up on the space station. So that, that's kind of the interaction we have with spacewalking and robotics to get things done, get things positioned on the space station. Sandy? And of course, for, for spacewalks are pretty much the most physically demanding thing that we do, both in training and on orbit. And so another reason that we exercise is so we're fit enough whenever we're called upon to go fix something outside and, and get in the suits. They're very bulky. Um, they weigh a few hundred pounds. You know, the joints kind of fit you how they fit you. They're sized for just a few different sizes, and they have some small adjustments that can be made. Uh, it's actually quite spectacular. I haven't done a spacewalk myself, but it's pretty fun to train for it. And everybody who's been out on a spacewalk says the view is just spectacular because you've got your peripheral vision as well. But it is, it's pretty demanding as we move on in, into uh, surface type situations, whether it's a near-Earth asteroid object or whether it's the moon or Mars, you know, we need to become a little bit more adaptable with our suits, and I think you'll hear a lot about that next. So Leland and I, I think, will wrap up. Uh, we have time for questions later. Miles will, will moderate that, and uh, maybe, Miles, you can come up and introduce our next speaker. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Don't go too far away. Okay. Don't go too far away. So, all right. A uh, lot of kids here. Who among the young people here would like to go to Mars someday? Raise your hand. Pretty good assortment. You know, it's, uh, well, you, you, you're too old. Sorry, pal. Uh, anyway, one-way trip for you, maybe. Yeah. I would do the one-way trip myself. Uh, and my, my wife would support that, probably. So, um, all right, so you saw these suits, right? And, and you can imagine these suits. Think of these suits as the world's smallest spacecraft, OK? They're, there's, there, it, it's filled with um, oxygen, and it's inflated to a certain level, and the gloves are inflated. And every time they move their hands, it takes a lot of force. And you can imagine, I was talking to John Grunsfeld, who uh, went to the, Hub, the Hubble Space Telescope three times on repair missions. And he's from Chicago. He said it's like working on your car, trying to change the spark plugs 20 below zero with your ski gloves on. So it's not easy to work in space. And so scientists and engineers have been thinking for years and years of ways to make it simpler. And our next guest has spent a lot of time doing that. I, I met her, incidentally. Uh, at a private facility that is um, geared, um, geared toward uh, civilians who want to go to space, to fly, for example, with um, uh, Bert Rutan and um, Sir Richard Branson's um, uh, Virgin Galactic spacecraft. Uh, a lot of scientists are thinking about ways they can go to space and conduct experiments on these brief suborbital hops. And so she's, she's getting ready to go to space herself, but she's also coming up with new and exciting ways 
uh, that people, human beings, can go to space and work more effectively, be more nimble, and explore in a more meaningful way. And in her spare time, she sails, uh, and as in, a matter of fact, has actually sailed all the way around the world. So she's a true adventurer, an engineer, and somebody who's really thinking out of the box on how human beings will explore in space in the future, that is to say, your generation. Please welcome David Newman. Good job. Hello, everyone. Afternoon. It's great to be here. I'm so glad to be here. It's wonderful to hear Sandy and Leland talk. I like sports and music as well. I was actually a ski racer, basketball player, played basketball at Notre Dame. And I thought, what am I going to do for a career? Well, I love to design and build things. I didn't know what engineering was, but it was for me. So I became an aerospace engineer. And now I have the privilege to be a professor at MIT. So what I'd like to do is share a little bit of uh, our research and some of the educational things we think about. We, we think about trying to keep these astronauts healthy and well, and as you heard, to perform as best they can in, in space suits. Now, these, these mock-up suits that you see in front of you, this is NASA's Mark III. It has some mobility. It has some soft parts and some hard parts that you see here. We're really working on the design for the shoulder joints, give a lot more mobility. What you see over here, to your left, that's a replica of the current suit. We call it the extravehicular mobility unit. It's about 140 kilos, close to 300 pounds fully charged. Now, it's great for space station and shuttle because it's weightless. Really, this is the world's smallest spacecraft. Kudos to the designers. You have all of your oxygen in there. It scrubs your carbon dioxide. It's really fantastic. But I'm thinking a little bit further out. The asteroids, moon, Mars, how can we have an astronaut go there work, be flexible, and get all their tasks done without wasting a lot of energy to overcome the suit. So if you can roll the first video. All spacesuits don't have to look like this. We don't have to look like the Michelin Man. I love this. This is back in 1969 from John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Maybe a spacesuit should look like this. I don't know. Maybe we should call it kind of the, the hamster in the cage. But for you kids, I want you, you're, you're going to design the next space suit. You need to, you're going to be the Martian astronauts. You guys are the ones who are going to walk on Mars. So we have to think about how to come up with a revolutionary system. What you see here is a subject, and those are Apollo arms and legs. So those come right from the Apollo generation spacesuit. So when you can be in the hamster cage if you want. He's not moving too fast. It's a little bit tippy. But again, just think of a different way to design it. So this is great. In the 60s, they were thinking about every way. Now, this is Dr. Paul Webb's space activity suit. Have you ever seen a space suit that was kind of shrunk wrap around an astronaut? Neither had I. But I really think that Dr. Webb had a great idea back in 1970, way before its time. So with my students in our lab at MIT the last 10 years, we've been thinking about alternative approaches to these kind of very heavy, wonderful spacesuits. But you know, we have to get to Mars and have mobility. So I need someone on a treadmill going like that. Now you heard Sandy talk a little bit about exercise in space. Also as a researcher, as an engineer, kind of aerospace, biomedical, engineering is my specialty. So we study the astronauts. I've had the privilege to fly three experiments up in space with the astronauts, get to train them and take data, and we're trying to figure it out. Now we are on long duration missions. So Sandy was there four and a half months. Thank goodness she didn't lose any bone. But when you look at all the astronauts, sometimes they lose 30% muscle mass or 40% strength loss in muscles. That's OK. That's the good news, right? You've been in a cast. You can, you can exercise after you take the cast, after you get your muscle strength back. It's kind of what the astronauts do. The skeletal loss we're really concerned about. Some crew lose 1% to 2% bone mineral density loss per month. OK. How long is the Mars mission going to last? Guesses? At least a year, probably about four. We're gonna, you're going to spend, my Martian astronauts, as you young folks here, you're going to spend a couple years round trip. And we don't want your muscles and bones. Then you're going to spend about 600 days on the surface. The only reason we're going to Mars with people is to look for the evidence of life. And it was a great question before. Robots and humans, we all do it together. The robots are there now. We have precursor missions. We're learning so much about the moon and Mars right now today. I get data downloads on the lunar surface every day. And we have the same from ours. So when humans go there, it's just the added value. 
you know, send them because they're brains and to make decisions, was there really past evidence of life on Mars? So the humans, the astronauts are going to be working with the machines. Well, it's my job to think about that muscle skeletal bone loss. We don't want a lot of musculoskeletal bone loss. So if you could roll the next slide. You saw Sandy exercising. The exercise device, kind of like being a power lifter, lifter, worked really well for her. We call this the ultimate countermeasure. I might spin you on a bed on your way to Mars. So this is artificial gravity. It's a two meter centrifuge with my graduate students there. And how about this? Maybe you're going to pedal your way to Mars. Now, you need the propulsion to get there, but I'm going to have you cycling all the way there. Because if you have a six month trip to get there and a year and a half to get home, if you're pedaling and exercising, we really need you probably exercising so you don't have that musculoskeletal loss. And the latest research is I might put some vibrational soles in the bottom of your pedals because that might really help bone loss as well. So that's what we think about in, in my lab and, and all over universities, trying to work with NASA and keep the astronauts really healthy and well and the best conditions so they can go out and do their tasks the best when they do get back to the moon or Mars. If we could roll the, the next slide. Another thing you might find in a research lab is a robot, right? OK, well, this is my robot. Here's Rudolph, one of my graduate students. Now, I use a robot as a surrogate astronaut. These folks are great and wonderful, but uh, why would we use a robot? See, the robot there, M. Tall Chief, is the name of my robot. If you know why, we'll give you a little extra NASA goodies. So there's, so it follows Rudolph, because we want it to do the exact motions. If you're in your suit or if you're on Mars, I want the robot to do the exact motions. It's the surrogate astronaut is following the same kinematics or arm angles, and it's giving me high precision torque measurements of the joint. How hard am I working? If I know how hard am I working at the elbow, how hard am I working in the knees, OK? So it's telling me how hard I'm working. I want the astronauts to use all their work to do exploration, not necessarily to overcome the suit. OK, so that leads us to uh, kind of a, a special treat we have here. If you can roll the next video. The suit that we're designing is called the bio suit. Now, it might not look like your conventional spacesuit here. There I am. I'm in what's called the moonwalker up in my lab. I'm hung up by the rafters. I'm literally experiencing Mars loading. Mars is three ace gravity. So on my feet there, I only see three ace of my body weight. I can move. I'm actually loping. I'm going to lope on, on Mars. You can run, walk. Loping is ideal. So um, if Rachel could come out, Rachel Foreman, graduate student at MIT, is going to model the bio suit for you here. Rachel, thanks for joining us. So this is our fourth version mock-up. A mock-up is a space that just looks and feels like it. It's not pressurizing her all the way to a third of an atmosphere. These suits have to pressurize you to a third of an atmosphere to keep you alive in space. This is about a tenth right now so that she can interact with you. But in the lab, in the vacuum chamber, we pressurize folks to the whole thing, a third of an atmosphere to keep you alive. It's pretty mobile. If she goes, she can march, she can bend down. You can't do that in, in the current suits, the gas pressurized suits. We're pressurizing her through the materials directly applied to her skin. So a gas pressurized balloon suit that you have to work really hard against or directly putting the pressure right through on the skin. Now the helmet, this is actually an Apollo helmet to demonstrate, is going to be pretty conventional. It looks, looks the same, conventional. She'll put that on so she has really good vision. She can see during the exploration. The smarts, the advancements in the helmet are we're going to put a really we're going to put an information system in there that gives you the topology. You can see the mountains of Mars and the craters on the moon. So we'll have a really rich information system within the helmet. But it looks kind of conventional because we want to run gas through there so that she's, you know, feels good. You don't want to shrink. You've all seen the Blue Man Group. No. We're not going to shrink wrap their heads. We don't want to shrink wrap the astronauts' heads. We want to give them a lot of air, but we do want to kind of put a second skin. This is called a second skin design. So we do want to use a second skin design on them. I think um, Rachel is, will uh, walk through. You can get a better look. We can tell you probably a little bit more about the design of it in, the, in questions and answers. All right, lights up. She can, um, there you go, she can bend down. You know, she can do push ups and jumping jacks in this. Uh, <laughs> so this is our vision then for the astronauts of the future to have a very mobile capability so that all of their energy is all about exploration and the search for life or other scientific endeavors. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Rachel. Rachel's in our lab at, at MIT, and she's, her research is on looking at astronaut performance and how to enhance astronaut performance. So I, <laughs> so I think that we're going to wrap it up and ask all the folks to come up here and take some questions and answers. We're going to have everybody come up. This, uh, let's, uh, let's do some questions now. It's kind of like fashion week here for just a moment. It's kind of you know? <laughs> You got to got to work in the pirouette a little bit, Rachel. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna work. All right. So uh, we're going to bring everybody up here. I've got the microphone. Raise your hand if you have a question for anybody on the panel, and I'm going to come to you, Phil Donahue style here. Oh my gosh, we got tons. We only have 15 minutes, so we're going to do the best we can to get through. Let's make them quick and pithy. Go ahead, young lady. You know how you do like experiments? How do you keep the stuff down? <laughs> How do you keep, well, we have um, glove boxes that are sort of contained, and we can use duct tape, which is wonderful, or Velcro, or magnets, or snaps, or zippers, or something like that. But we do have to worry about how to keep stuff down. Good okay, question. Yeah, yeah, good question. Is there aliens in space? <laughs> That's the second most common question, <laughs> right? Right after the bathroom okay. one, right? Okay, I didn't see any aliens, but, uh, you know, you know, Sandy looked kind of like an alien with her reptilian hand when she had the water. But no, we didn't see any aliens. But that doesn't mean they're not out there. OK, young lady. Um, do you take any animals up to space to see how they react? We have actually taken animals to space. While I was up there, there were two spiders there. And they were the kind of spiders that eat their web every night and then do another, a new web in the morning. And so we got to see how they changed their web making. And I, know, I don't know if I ever saw a pattern, because some days they were nice and neat webs, and some days they were just a mess. Um, some days are better than others, yeah, obviously. There you right? go. Yeah. We've had uh, mice and um, ants and bees and fish and spiders and caterpillars. And so we're slowly trying to learn about how animals behave in space. Getting the ride of their life. OK, go. Yeah. Uh, how's it like to be back on Earth after going to space? Like, do you feel different? Does the grab, does the, I don't know, does the Earth feel well, different? Well, when we first came home, my first flight, I was, I was uh, you know, our, our commander was telling us, like, move our head around a little bit as we were getting the Gs back on the shuttle as we are coming in the atmosphere. And so that helped us, you know, when you get out of your seat and you're walking down, that you don't just kind of, you know, your vestibular system is trying to kind of refigure out how to make things work from, you know, turning and knowing what attitude your head's in. So it took me about maybe two days or so to really get back to normal. Um, one of the things that you had to do is look at the horizon. The horizon would help you regauge your gyros. So I didn't do that my first flight, but my second flight I did, and I felt much better, much faster. Yeah, and let me just add real quick. It, you feel very heavy. And those of you who are patiently waiting in the audience with your hands up, you're working very hard because gravity is trying to pull your arm back down. And I felt like, even as we were coming through the atmosphere, I was getting pulled and pressed and just attached to my seat. Yeah. And it's very interesting, I think, be, to be able to go into space and come back and understand what gravity is like that. You are just being pulled all the time, just pinned to the ground. And it's, it's fascinating. So uh, Sandy, after your long flight, how long before you felt like normal? Well, it took, me, it took me two weeks to have the fundamental energy level you need to operate in, in, zero, in, in gravity. Every day, about 5 or 6 o'clock for two weeks, I just wanted to lay down because my body was tired. And it took about a week to get my neural vestibular system set so I could you know, I, do I have the these. same problem myself. <laughs> anyway, all right, go ahead. What happens to the garbage that you can't reuse or recycle on the space station? On the space station, actually, garbage is one of the big problems because people, it's always an afterthought, right? The trash. I mean, think about it. You just kind of throw it in the trash bag and it goes to the curb. So what we do is uh, the Progress is an unmanned cargo vehicle that arrives from Russia every three or four months. And Japan and Europe have vehicles that show up uh, once or twice a year. And we end up loading a lot of the trash that we can't reuse onto those vehicles. And then they burn up. Uh, as they re-enter the atmosphere, so we're using the atmosphere as a big garbage incinerator. But ideally, you want to be able to recycle as much as possible. All right, young man, go ahead. My question is this: like, if you're on space, can you like, like, how do you swim? Like, uh, can you like, you, I, you told in the presentation that you could do sports, and uh, could you swim or play basketball? <laughs> Bas basketball will be tough unless you change the game. So you go find a corner in the space station, and your hoop would be near the corner. So you have to bank the ball off the corners to get into the hoop. So that could be kind of a new game you can make up. But you can't just shoot regularly, because once you shoot, the ball is going to take the trajectory that you, you shot. 
It's not going to come down and arc down into the hoop. You, you know the sport you should do in space is Quidditch, right? Yeah. From Harry Potter, Actually, right? No, That'd you're be the perfect right. sport, wouldn't it? Right? Exactly. Yeah. You, you'd right. need little rocket-propelled yeah. broomsticks exactly. to change direction, exactly. but you could do yeah. that. <laughs> uh, but I don't think swimming would work very well either. All right, young man, go. What was your favorite experiment that you did in space? Gosh, there, there were so many interesting experiments. I think one of the fun things that we had was we were lighting little fires to... It was in the glove box, and we were hopefully lighting. little fires. Yeah, yeah. Little, little, fires. Little, fires. little fires, little teeny fires. little fires, because yeah. com combustion changes in space too. The whole the way fire burns, and we're trying to understand that for all kinds of reasons. And so we finally got the first combustion experiments in space while we were there, and we were lighting little fires and trying to figure out when they smoke and watching it. It's really, it was really fascinating. And flames, flames are circular in space, yeah. right? They don't do this. Yeah, because that's, no that's convection, an oxygen. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. a yeah. Con convection driven yeah. uh, phenomenon. Right. So Go ahead, young lady. What's the funnest thing you do in space? The funnest thing, hmm. I think yeah. for me it was, uh, you know, just after our hard work and our mission, sitting down with a group of people and having dinner and playing with our food, you know, the, the water bubble, like, like uh, trying to eat your food and have it float all over the place. That was you, pretty much fun. Looking out the window's got to count, right? Looking yeah, that's fun, window. right? Yeah, yeah, you never get tired of looking out the window. Do you guys yeah. really press your nose against the glass? I mean, and, and yeah, do, can you use Windex to clean you, it? You I mean, what do you to. do? Once yeah. you press your nose against the glass, you really can't get any good photos there. It ruins it, doesn't yeah, it? it does. Yeah. Okay, young man. Can animals adjust to space? Can, what, can, uh, uh, can, can animals adjust animals. to space? Of course, they, we're animals. They, we adjust. But, you know, some yeah. animals do better than others, well, right? The, uh, the mice seem to fall into a couple categories. There's the way cool mice. And they just float along inside their little habitat and they're not freaking out or anything. They're just going with the flow. And then there's the, the more anxious mice and they're kind of doing this the whole time because they haven't quite figured out why there's nothing underneath their paws or, or what's going on. So, so we have, seem to have two, little, two levels of mice so far. That would be an interesting study to figure out what makes a mouse anxious or cool. I, I, you know? yeah, yeah, we do that. Yeah. We actually do that yeah. research. That's what do we, you? That's what, yeah? yeah? Well, that's why we fly different animals human animals, but that's why you fly little animals as well, see how their developmental processes go, and the, the hypothesis is, how will they adapt? We actually have a hypothesis about the astronauts, they adapt really well. Maybe they can have dually adapt to Earth, one gravity, and they can also adapt to microgravity. Like you can adapt to putting your glasses on or spectacles, well, it's right. a little more complicated for a space flight. It's all, you know, body motor control. Maybe space flight programs to float around, get back to Earth, now you have your 1G Earth programs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, young lady. If you are on a spacewalk in the spacesuit and you need to scratch your nose or your face, what would you do? There you go. That's a big one. Explain that one, yeah. Um, that's a great question. You know what? It hasn't been solved. That's why we need you. <laughs> you cannot scratch your nose in the current spacesuit and not with our spacesuit either. You can. And this has been a problem in the past. There have been astronauts who've had real. So you scratch before. Yeah, you you know, it's a good. It's can. a good time to practice meditation. <laughs> and you can move your nose over and. Maybe rub it on something. Well, the Valsalva pad the Valsalva in the front of the, yeah. right there that you use to Valsalva, you can get your nose there. But if it's like a back in here somewhere, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> but it's funny because you forget. I, I, I haven't done a spacewalk, but I've trained. And I've been in the water, and my nose starts itching. And without even thinking about it, I move my hand. It's like clonk. It has <laughs> the clonk. It it's like, oh, so yeah, well. wait, that won't work. You know? <laughs> so right, this suit is That's great for that. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm kind of wearing fingerless gloves here. I don't know if you can see. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading about the biosuit research. And I read that you had trouble getting the pressure suit to generate enough pressure. So I was wondering if you could do some kind of intermediate thing where it was like regular astronaut gloves until the fingers, and then the fingers were made out of the stuff that squeezes. Yep, it's a really, it's a really good point. Boy, so, you did your homework, by the way. Can yeah. Give her a round of applause, Sarah. Right? That's right. I mean, that's why I think it was gloves are good on Earth, because your, your hands are warm, but you can move your fingers. I think right. you have a future student here. So yeah, mechanical counterpressure, and uh, in all honesty, the glove design is as complicated as almost the whole suit, because think of how many degrees of freedom you have. So we do have gloves that are kind of shrink wrap or mechanical counterpressure gloves, but we're st still in the research. They're not ready to, for flight yet, still in the research level. We can get up to 20 to the, the, the suit. We can actually get to 30 kilopascals now. So we've, we've kind of hit our design reference with the suit. The gloves were probably still about 20, 25 kilopascals. So, so how many years before this suit could really be... Oh, you know, out there in space. What do you think? Um, depends. It all depends it's on all the funding. The money, right? it's, yeah, all <laughs> it's all about the money. It's all about the money. I have, we have great students. Look at this. You know, yeah. we have all the student. We have all the knowledge we need. Um, we need a little bit more time. If if uh, if we really put our mind to it, probably two to three years might take us ten. We'll be ready for Mars. That's for sure. All right. Go ahead. Um, how does a person become an astronaut? 
Well, you know, it's remarkably simple. You call and get an application and, and put it on file. I mean, we're basically civil servants. Uh, we do have a mix of military and civilian astronauts, so some people choose to take the military route. There are certain requirements that you have to meet as a minimum, uh, you know, technical degree or a medical degree. or, or it's, it's probably useful to have at least a master's, but the application's now online. Craigslist, right? Yeah, well, maybe. Yeah. You just apply, and then the application goes on file. When they're ready to select a class, they make an announcement. Anybody who's got an active application on file is considered exactly. um, eligible, and we start you know, going through the application. So the trick is, of course, building up your experience to match what, what you All right, need. But, and, and here's where you sound like, well, I sound a little bit like a parent. I don't want to interject too much here. Yeah. But you got to study hard. Yes. you got to stay in school and study hard. Go ahead, Lee. But what you need to do is study what you love doing. Yep. You know, don't, don't study something because you think it's going to get you to become an astronaut. You know, the astronaut is a cherry on the top. We have scientists and engineers all throughout NASA that have done really great and wonderful things. So I was, a, I was a scientist before I became an astronaut for 10 years at NASA Langley. And so was, you know, so was Sandy. She was an engineer. So do what you love doing. Eat your green beans. Listen to your <laughs> teachers and your parents. No, and just have a passion for what you're doing. You know, with your, your spirit and our opportunity, you can do anything. What fun stuff do you do in space? Fun stuff in space. Well, we already talked a little bit about that. One other fun thing you do in space. Oh, gosh, the, the top one is just looking out the window. Yeah. Being a projectile, having someone, you know, you curl up in a ball and have someone just push you like Throw bowling you with astronauts, <laughs> just roll you down the, down the it's module. It's fun to be a projectile, huh? <laughs> All right. Come here, young lady. Come here. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Young man. Um, why isn't there air in space? Deva. Oh, Deva. <laughs> Deva. <laughs> or maybe your future student would want to answer that one. I don't know. So um, when you saw the astronauts in the space station and the shuttle, there's air because we put an artificial environment there. We put a whole life support system. So it's kind of like what we have here in this room. And we package that up and put the pressure and put the air in. But it's a great question. The vacuum of space, we find out in orbit, what we find on the moon, the vacuum, there's no air there. So you wouldn't be able to survive without a space suit on. We have to bring our oxygen. We have to put you in a pressurized suit. So the vacuum of space, there's not air. That's why it's so clean. There's a vacuum up there. All right, so go ahead, young man. What happens, what happens when you get sick in space? Ooh. Good question. Oh, now, you good give, you, question. can you be honest about the... Been there. Might, Been yeah, there, done we, that. We didn't really talk about this, but this is a very common problem. Yeah, uh, when, when I got to orbit on my, my first and second flight, I had a, had a turkey sandwich. And I probably shouldn't have eaten that turkey sandwich right when I got to space. But um, did some work, and I just so felt... you rent, rented the turkey sandwich, huh? Yeah. Rented, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, but we have, you know, bags like you do on the ground if you get sick in an airplane. And you just... The thing is, though, this stuff just comes out and goes everywhere. So you have to make sure you capture it, close it off, and put it away in the wet trash. So, it's, I mean, it's something that happens. And people that fly in the zero-G airplane sometimes get sick, sometimes they don't. But it doesn't, it's not a good corollary for if you'll get sick in space. Because in the, in the zero-G plane, I did not get sick. But in space, I did. Hey, Deva, it, it, as I understand it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, more women than men get sick in space. Is that true? Um, not exactly. We don't have any statistical significance. Um, and we don't have as many women flying. Oh, okay. So we don't have a gender difference. But so the that was some guy who told me that. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. Yeah, probably, you know, probably don't listen to these guys. guys so, no, you know. it's not true. But for boat sickness or car sickness, there isn't, really isn't a corollary. We do know that it's your vision and then your vestibular system, your inner ears. And it's a conflict between those signals right. that makes you pretty upset. But you get over it. I mean, I've sailed around the world. Hey, I get seasick. But hey, you get seasick the first night. You know, everyone adapts to it. Right. And Sandy, and actually, for you, it, I mean, I assume in a long stint, eventually your body oh, yeah, you adapt figures pretty, this out, right? Yeah, you yeah. adapt pretty quickly. But they tell us a trick as a rookie, and this refers to, yeah. to what you were talking about, David, is the very, for the first 24 hours, keep yourself in a 1G orientation so that your eyes have sort of a normal vision, because that's how you trained, right? You've been standing on the floors and you've been going down the ladder, so don't immediately dive head first down the ladder into the mid deck. And, right and start uh, projecting. So keep your head up keep as your if head it up were for a day, and that helps. gravity. OK, go ahead. Hi. What is the material on the spacesuit, and is there a purpose for all of the red seaming? Great. Thank you very Good much. Good um, question. 
love the question. So it's, um, since we're trying to apply a third of an atmosphere, it's actually a passive elastic. This is our fourth try at it. And it's the MIT colors, why it's silver and red. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have white ones too. <laughs> um, and so underneath, the silver part is kind of passive elastics. And the red lines are really key. So you saw Rachel doing some movements. I want to give her maximum mobility, but I still have to apply this pressure. How do I do that? So the design, that actually the patent behind the design, the red lines are, sorry about the technical part, something called lines of non-extension. Just real quickly, if you put circles all over your skin and moved, they would turn elliptical. So you go from a circle to an ellipse. There'll be two bisecting diameters that pivot. And you connect the red dots. We didn't try out, we didn't start out to be a Spider-Man suit. But uh, the three-dimensional mathematical analysis leads you to this red pattern. Hmm. And that's what's key to get the maximum mobility and keep the structure, if you will. It must have been very painstaking, getting that all. Oh, no, come on. No, no problem. Five no minutes, problem. five minutes. No, yeah. no. All right, young lady, go ahead. When you're in space, do you get homesick? Good question. Actually, you know, I, I was a little homesick at Christmas, I have to admit, because my father had passed away earlier in the year, and it was going to be rough on my family. And, but the good thing is that we get a video conference with our family every week. And so I got to see my family every week. And then at Christmas, I spent two hours on a video conference with them. And that was really nice. So you have a lot of ways to keep in touch with your family. You can make phone calls or do email. You got the video conference. So you can stay connected pretty well. I think one okay. last question. Well, we, we had the last question. OK, this is it. You get it. Hey, when you're on a spacewalk, how well are you tethered to the space station? And do you have a fail safe if you go ahead. let go? Ahead. Go ahead. Can we take it? Okay. Yeah, you did some space walking well, preparation. I, I trained. I didn't do one. Well, so. there, we have some, uh, we have some um, they're like little clips that you grab, hold on to your suit, and you, you translate around, and you have these wires that run around the station. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're clipped on. And we have, you know, procedures that we follow routinely to make sure that you're tethered to these, to these, um, these guy wires. But if you do come undone, we do have a, a device that you can pull out some little hand controllers and then it shoots nitrogen out of the back, and you can point yourself in the right direction. You get like, what, 10, 15 seconds of, of burst, and hopefully you're pointed in the right way. So like it's, a, like a it's like a little jetpack. It's like a jetpack. It's yeah. a little jetpack. Jet well, Jetson's yeah. jetpack. Yeah. 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 But it's kind of, it's, it's no different than really mountain climbing. You just want to make sure you're always strapped in somehow. All right, we're, we're out of time for questions. I know there's a ton more, but these two characters are going to be in the NASA booth in Gould Plaza, right out here, as of 3 p.m. today, right? Yep. And uh, they, will, uh, they, they will answer your questions till how long? Till They'll be there for days. Three, three, They'll be, three, there, three, for three, three, days. be there for days. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, feel free to go and get your questions. And now we have one special treat here. Now, we don't have enough for everybody. But our six students, stand up. Once again, give them a round of applause for their wonderful questions. Did you like the answers? Are good. Come on up on the stage. And we want to tell about a little surprise for them. Uh, we brought some, well, I didn't bring it. Well, yeah, you did. They, you brought it. Astronaut food. They're going to be our astronaut food samplers. Right We're going to give you a, a, an unbiased uh, critique yeah, maybe do of the astronaut the food, right? You're just going to tell us what it's all about. Together. Have a little sample. What do we, what do we have in here, Leland? Uh, I think we have some chocolate pudding cake. There's one. And we have apricot cobbler. This is Leland, all. tell him to hold it straight up. Yeah, you hold it straight up because it's cut on the yeah. side. This way, other way. Yeah. This way, yeah. So you're going to scoop it down. And we have inside. that messy so, gravity here. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. gravity is you know, messing boy, us yeah, up. Really. Okay, we have vanilla pudding. And these are going to be our taste testers. Another vanilla pudding. Mm -hmm. So these right. are some of our, our favorite desserts. I mean, some of our favorite desserts. And as I mentioned, yeah. we were on a 16-day we're on a right. rotating Here's menu. And so you do get quite a lot of variety, although the textures are all the I same. I think you guys can dig in. Go ahead and start yeah, eating. Go ahead, go ahead and start. No, don't, don't be bashful. Be, be careful. Don't be bashful. Um, what you end up missing a lot is crispy and fresh. So, for example, I wanted lettuce uh, and something that was crunchy when I got back. And uh, there's some food that tastes very good, uh, like the, these desserts I think are pretty good, and cream spinach is good, and... And some of the Russian uh, vegetable dishes are very good. Some food is very bad. The meatloaf is not so good. Um, and what's that, uh, that pickled herring that the Russians have? Or what is it? They have a fish thing that yeah. I think um, what, the, the first US astronaut to fly to the space station Mir, his food didn't show up on time. His name is Norm Thagard. And Norm Thagard, you meet him today, he's probably 130 pounds dripping wet. 
he lost 30 pounds. I mean, he, he it was a serious weight loss because he couldn't stand the, the, yeah. uh, the fish and all the other things. It wasn't, it's just not what you're used to. It's yeah, a different it's, diet. It, and it really is a matter of getting used to it. And we do taste testing in Russia now, so we, we can yeah, get I used to Yeah, I think they learned food. a lesson off of that one. Yeah, because yeah. they have, a, you know, a lot of the cans that come up are Russian food and they're, they're, it's heavy meats and stews, which is right. great, but you can't eat that all the time. All right, let's get an assessment okay. here. How is the chocolate pudding? Okay, thumbs up. With it's thumbs up and very, very chocolatey. Very All right. chocolatey. Yeah. All right, what do you got? You got chocolate pudding cake too? What do you think? Be honest. What? Good. Good. Thumbs up. All right, well, you have vanilla pudding. How is it? Different. Uh, okay, is it thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> Masamenos, I think, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I you appreciate know, her candor. Do you know yes. what I did on Orbit? I added this rehydrated strawberries to that, and it made it a ah, lot better. Ah, yeah. now, see, that's yeah. it. That was good. Got, yeah. you, you learned the All right, you had, you have vanilla pudding, too? What do you, what do you think? I thought it was pretty good. Pretty good? Thumbs okay. up or thumbs Scale down? Scale of one to ten, what would you say? Seven. Seven. Seven, okay, seven. Okay, and you are a apricot cobbler. cobbler. How is it? It tastes better than it looks. <laughs> and actually, that's it's a kind of like your meal that you yeah. made, right? It's, it's all space food. It tastes, it's, it's not but, not yeah. a visual thing, no, is really it? Not. No, it you isn't. Eat I, it. And what what is your assessment of the apricot cobbler? It tastes, it tastes great. Like it tastes really good. Do you like it? All right. yeah, that's one of my great. favorites too. Yeah. All right. the, the people in the kitchen at uh, Johnson Space Center will be glad to hear all this job. because they work very hard on all this. All okay. right. Well, listen. You guys were great. You all were great. Dave, uh, everybody, Rachel, Sandy, good Leland, job. all of you. Great, great session. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Go out in the square and, and see the booths and ask them some questions. Have a good day.